The thing about third stream music, okay, you can look at it in three different aspects. The first aspect is the actual classical definition of it, which is this movement started by Gunther Schuller in the late 50s, early 60s, and John Lewis was actually a part of it, which was an actual conscious attempt at the synthesis of jazz elements with classical elements to form a kind of meta language and a different way of jazz improvisers having an extended palette and kind of a new genre, a third way, a third stream. You can look at it that way. Rand Blake, who was a student of Gunther Schuller, then started teaching at New England Conservatory and third string became a didactic device. New England Conservatory started a third stream department. And at that point, it became not so much the synthesis between jazz and classical, but it became actually a didactic thing for improvisers to have an extended palette and to be able to synthesize various aspects. So the actual third stream department became a department of teaching within New England Conservatory that was parallel to the jazz department there because they were one of the first schools to actually have a jazz department. And it was for improvisers, but maybe that people that didn't want to define themselves as improvising within a jazz structure. But you would study various musics. Your training was a very basic part of it. And the whole idea was to let an improviser have time to kind of really develop a distinct personality by melding whatever they were trying to meld together. So it kind of took on a different aspect than the original one, which was um, a, a group of improvisers trying to develop a body of work based on Gunther Schuller's original idea. So the, the didactic aspect of it at New England Conservatory is the second pang. The third pang of that concept is um, that now, after like 20 or 30, 40 years of that idea being out there in such a conscious way, there's now a whole group of improvisers who kind of improvise in a non-idiomatic way. And it's no longer called third stream. In fact, at the New England Conservatory, I think that department's called the creative improvisation now. And it no longer is such so well-defined in that specific way that it was in the late 50s, early 60s. But now you have a whole generation of non-idiomatic improvisers coming up. Oftentimes there are people that have classical music backgrounds. They play some jazz. They want to improvise. They don't want to be classical musicians straight up, or they don't want to be defined as jazz musicians, but they have facility in both languages and they tend to write their own compositions, improvise their, within their own compositions in a non-traditional jazz way, even though there might be traditional jazz elements in their language and in how they approach it. So there's a whole generation of people that have been doing that for like the last 20 or 30 years, and they don't fall into any neat category, but they play in various ways. I mean, they actually might sometimes play in a traditional jazz setting. They might sometimes do like classical compositions of composers who might have parts of their pieces that are open with improvisation. And there's a whole generation of musicians that fit in that kind of way of seeing things, way of doing things, way philosophy of viewing music. And they're, they're, um, this concept is, they're an outgrowth of this concept. It's almost like this concept incubated in the ether for 20, 30 years, and it just birthed um, people that naturally, organically operate that way without consciously having approached music in that way. And there are a lot of these people. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole genre of, and a whole genre of, of music, a whole slew of people that operate in this way and a whole um, approach of music where people nowadays um, naturally gravitate to that way of seeing things. It's almost like the, the hundredth monkey um, approach that after a certain amount of people did it for a while, it just kind of naturally created its own wavelength of people that fall into this category almost by nature or by just that's what's in the air. You might have a lot to add because you grew up like 
around all of this and all the founders of it like were like your babysitters and stuff. I did, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, my father is Joe Maneri, and um, he was a composer but an improviser. And I, I think his life in a lot of ways kind of expresses Third Stream in a way that he was a... Uh, first born from immigrants from Europe, so he's growing up in New York, you know, in the 20s and 30s, and then playing Greek weddings and, and pop tunes and this and that, but quit school at 15, and then suddenly wanted to study music, so he studied with Joseph Schmidt, who was in, a student of Albenberg, who was a student of Schoenberg, so he got this whole lineage of, of kind of composition. He's writing music, but he's playing pop tunes, he's playing folk music from all around the world, the, the Italian roots of his generation. And there was no separation to him. And I think a lot of people of that generation, they just kind of, they didn't fuse it like fusion music. I'm gonna mix jazz with classical, or I'm gonna mix like uh, Greek folk music with like a hip hop beat. It was a real internalization of what that music meant to them and the new music, and it was all vibrant, it was very, it, it wasn't uh, about academies of music of the past, it was what the music that was happening of the day, really expanding upon it and mixing everything, every knowledge you could to get at something that was very personal and soulful. And I think that was a great mix of Third Stream, that soulfulness of like the blues and, and, and folk musics and, and jazz, but also mixed with the vibrancy of the new classical music that was coming out of Schoenberg and Webern and this whole expansive kind of idea that was happening in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, so it was a very exciting time, art and, 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 and movie, everything was just kind of exploding. And I think music was very fortunate and, and I think Gunther was rightly uh, convinced to like kind of give it a title, Third Stream. Yeah because there was that synthesis going on naturally. It wasn't like he created it and put a stamp on it. It was just happening. Uh, and it, it, it was a way to say like, hey, let's not discount this, especially in conservatories at the time. Jazz programs were just very new. Uh, so like any jazz program that was put into a conservatory may have been like, let's be more academic about this. Let's see how so-and-so did this. But he wanted to like really say like, let's keep the vibrancy alive of what's coming forward with also looking at the past, but really keeping that alive. So the categorizations weren't so much you're stuck here, you're stuck there, but let's breathe in all the same air. And I, I thought it was fantastic. When Schoenberg, Webern, and Berg were, that was a lifestyle. Those guys were not academic composers. They lived their language. I mean, Webern really lived it because he got sh shot in the head. <laughs> but, I, mean, yeah, I mean, these are guys that lived in poverty and, um, and they really believed in their language. And it was, the language was a live thing to them. It was life and death. I mean, it was, it was the poetics of um, existence for them. It wasn't an academic exercise. It, it was life to them. And it's just interesting that Schoenberg, you know, when he, I think he moved to LA, I think, and he heard some jazz and he freaked out. He loved it. I mean, he really, he really knew that there was something going on in American music that was vital to the 20th century and was what music really was meant to be. And he felt it. I mean, he, he, I don't know exactly who he heard. It might have been Ellington, actually, I'm not sure. But he, he knew that, that there was something with this that was, and that's, that's the way those guys approached music also. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. He was very fascinated by pop music of the time. I remember yeah. there was a story my father told me about, I think it was David Raskin who wrote Laura. Right. And he came to Schoenberg. He said, I want to study with you. I want to learn this and that. And, and Schoenberg told him, it's like, well, what do you need to study with me? Like, what about Laura? <laughs> that's a great <laughs> tune. Like, you don't need anything. Just, right. you know, those kind of feelings, yeah. I think, were very important. And I think the progenitors, the founders of Third Stream would acknowledge this, even though there was a movement with Gunther Schuller and George, John Lewis was involved with it. Um, those guys would always tell you that Duke Ellington was a universalist and aspects of the Third Stream modernist approach always existed within the um, mindset and vocabulary of how Duke Ellington approached composition, especially the extended pieces. And he was always aware of just trying to be a modern musician, whatever that meant. I mean, so he was soaking in 
all the aspects that were in the air that might have been the same aspects that you know Alvin Berg or, or Webern were soaking in, and, and and so they all acknowledged Ellington as a universalist in that way. So that that just needs to be emphasized that like like Gunther and J John Lewis didn't think they were doing something that nobody else ever ever did. Now of course Ellington never consciously approached it in that way, but there's aspects of some of his suites that just hit a universal realm that make it partake of those things that are in the air. And you know, that's what being a great artist is. So anyway.